perfect segue into Sullivan. I was trying to figure out how to live stream and share and screen share during a live stream. So I go to StreamYards, I set up the link, I send it to myself and myself only, and I'm sitting there futzing around for 12 minutes on my computer trying to figure out how to bring up a screen. Fine, done. I thought I figured it out. 20 minutes later, I notice that I get a YouTube warning and the video has been removed for inappropriate content. And I'm still obsessing about it because I'm not going to relax until they take away that warning because it's bull crap. The first video that I pulled up just to see if it was working was a dude perfect video. And so apparently um, the warning says that after repeated requests, I did not remove the, uh, the video from YouTube. I was like, this all happened in 15 minutes. I didn't know there was even a content ID claim on it on an unlisted video that had nobody watching. It was a test. I, the video is called test. So long story short, I decided not to air, uh, not to do the live stream reaction to the Sullivan because I didn't want to get into trouble. And then the funny thing is, I noticed a tweet, someone sent me a tweet yesterday saying, it was a tweet coming from someone, it's in one of my videos, it's in the video from today, saying that um, apparently Sullivan issued an order that it was prohibited to republish the hearing. And I, Robert, I sent it to you. I'm gonna just get out. Do we like this mode better? Well, I think we like this mode better. Um, what do we think of that? Is that, is that I mean, I, I can't even understand that. If you're making something public, accessible to the public, then they then cannot republish it afterwards or, or, or use sections of it? The way they interpret this, uh, and all the federal courts do this for the most part, because like every Zoom conference I've had with a federal court, they've told me you can't record, you can't uh, broadcast it separately, you can't uh, rebroadcast it, and that uh, you'd be subject to criminal penalties if you did. I mean, they, they lecture they lecture all of us at the beginning. So the issue is there's a right of public access to the courts, and that right of public access to the courts uh, I believe they should have been doing this sort of visual, uh, verbal audio access all the time. They weren't doing that until COVID, until most of the time in federal courts, state courts have broad access, but federal courts have generally interpreted the right of access to the courts in a more limited way than state courts have. And the net effect of that is the federal court has to allow their physical courtroom to be accessible within certain rules, but they have not. Uh, that's why there's almost no cameras in any federal courtroom. Uh, that which I disagree with entirely. Um, and they and they make they make public access, frankly, very difficult. When, when public access was anticipated under the Constitution, they thought the whole community could go and watch. Um, we, often, I mean, there were trials that were done outside, weren't even done inside a physical space, so that so it had no limits on who could hear and watch and listen. Um, and so I've always disagreed with this restriction, but they hate for anything other than a controlled transcript by the court reporter. And well, I won't get into it, but let's just say sometimes funny things happen with those transcripts. The uh, uh, so the uh, with some, certain certain judges. Uh, and so I think that that but yes, legally, they can do exactly that, that they can make it. Now, what's weird is people were live streaming it at the time and that's recorded and it's still accessible. So how does that fit into the rule? It's, it's less than clear. Let, let me back, back it up one one step because I imagine there has to be a difference between a Zoom call that is being organized for convenience versus, for example, when the Court of Appeal puts it up on their YouTube page and it remains on the YouTube page. But am I, well, am I, the Court of Appeals allows oral uh, oral hearings to be publicly accessible. Yeah. Trial courts almost never do. But I, I, but from, from what I'm understanding, I have a friend um, well, and, and this is even from from a state court, but they they said it's about the money. If if people, it's it's about they want people to buy the transcripts, yes. and that and and, and that, and that those are, tell Nate how uh, Nate tell folks how expensive those can be. Yes, yes, they yes they they, they can they thousands can, and thousands of dollars yes. for just one daggum <laughs> transcript. So that is a source of revenue for the court, and if people are allowed to just record the whole proceedings. No one goes and gets the transcript. So it's you know, I, I understand, but but Bart, you know, Bar Barnes is right about the history, but at the end of the day, it comes down to a dollar figure. If everybody can just record the transcript, then the courts aren't getting those thousand dollar fees to so that and that court reporter is not putting it all together and sending it to you a package and forcing you to read it. So, you know, it's it's the the court's playing a game, and that's that's the reason why Viva has that problem. Okay, so so and it was an interesting thing. So the Zoom calls are different than if the court puts it up and leaves it up on their own on their own YouTube channel. There, you can pull whatever you want and republish and rebroadcast. This, I guess, was a dial in, and they ha had different rules. Um, it's interesting because it, it was who someone just told me who it was. Leslie McAdoo Gordon, I think she was one who, who posted the tweet about the court order, 
which I thought was you know very funny because a lot of people were live streaming it. My argument there would be we're not republishing it. We're just we're just streaming it in real time. But, but hopefully nobody has to make that argument. Uh, let's get into the actual hearing. Um, it was painful. Uh, our prediction was wrong. It managed to be longer than the friggin' appealed hearing. So I, I think it's someone told me I might have made a mistake. The one hour intro of the facts was that Sullivan or Gleason? That was Sullivan. But but, but he was making a he was obviously just going to be appealed, right? So mm -hmm. he's making so so what you do is you make a, a clean record for appeal. So you just read the I've, I've had to sit through this time and time before where they have to read through the whole crap. But that's what he's doing. So he's preserving. He's making a clean record for appeal. That was a dirty clean record. That was that was an incomplete clean record, as far as I'm concerned. I thought I thought that was Sullivan. I thought that was Gleason making that intro, and I was like, "Well, this is very interesting." Glossing over probably the most important stuff of this. Um, okay, so that's, that's what funny that uh, you could confuse Gleason and Sullivan, <laughs> as if both were pretending to be judges in the proceeding. Judges, prosecutors, and and uh, it's. It was a joke. I mean, the, the inter the interplay. What's the word? I'm like the dialogue between Gleason and Sullivan. It was like, let's see who can kiss up to the other the most and and be thankful for it. Um, we we'll okay, little so addendum out there for everybody. You are not supposed to be called a judge when you are no longer on the bench inside a legal proceeding. Uh, I, I'm the kind of contumacious individual who brings this up repeatedly. Uh, mediators, arbitrators love to go by the label judge. And they get mad. I refuse to call them judge because I'm like, that's uh, that's wrong. That's unethical. That's unprofessional. Judges are supposed to demand that people not do so because the fear is that an ordinary person is confused with who the heck the judge is in the room when two different people are being referred to as judge. Uh, and it, it confers upon them a status that is that's elitist and is completely contrary to our democratic principles. Um, now, there's not a single ex-judge that appreciates my pointing this out, but it is still true. And it, it agitated the heck out of me. They referred to him as Judge Gleason. Um, Nate, well, I mean, Nate, what, what do you think? What was your ultimate takeaway, uh, your sentiment from the hearing? Oh my God. Um, well, number one, I, um, I, I love, I love, um, what's her name? Um, um, Slinta Pretty. Oh yes, yeah, she's, she's, she's fantastic. Um, but this judge, he, he had like, I, I think she had some really, really strong points, but at a point, I think she took the bait. Sullivan's bait is, and, and again, this is, I have no inside knowledge. This is just my opinion. And I hate even giving them all my videos. So that's why I don't give them all my videos. But here's my opinion. Sullivan wants to keep this going past the election, right? He wants to keep this going. And Sid and Sydney played right into that, right? I want to make this motion. Okay, let's do it next week. I want to make this motion. Okay, put right in there. I've never seen a judge so happy to see so many motions and to say, no, we're not going to hear most of the time. I'm not going to hear that crap. He was saying, I want to hear everything. That tells me that's a judge who doesn't want to go to <laughs> give, make a decision anytime soon. Just write it down. Give me papers. I, what, what about this? Have you talked to the president? Now we got a bar issue. Let's talk to the board. It's like, it just went, it seemed like at every point he was stretching this out longer and longer and longer. And now when you got election day less than a month away and Trump out of office, if he loses and, you know, I think they're playing the long game because let, let, let's just be honest. You're going into November, right? This is, you got another month before they go back. Then you go into November, right? You go into November, you, then you start having, you know, the holidays. Then you start having Christmas. Then nobody's coming back until June, you know, January 6th. And now you got a new Congress sworn in. Then you got the presidential election. You know, then you got the president being sworn in or a new president being sworn in on January 20th. I think Sullivan is playing the long game. And I think Sidney Powell played into that. She should have tried to close this out today. But I do understand she had some technical legal issues she had to deal with. Number one, she had to deal with the plea, right? And I think. It was masterful, masterful how she attacked the plea, the, the plea colloquy. Masterful, right? She said it was done incorrectly. She's telling that judge, you did it incorrectly. This is why this plea shouldn't be sh shouldn't be accepted. Masterful job, but it gave Sullivan what he wanted. Okay, you thought we did it wrong? Let's write it down and put us in motion. And now Judge Gleason is going to get some more money from the federal government. So it, it was in trying to defend the client, I think she allowed Sullivan to get what he wants to continue this farce. But now on the points of law, number one, 
there's a rule, there's rule 12B um, for the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure about withdrawing a plea. And they specifically talk about withdrawing a plea before a plea's been entered and after a plea's been entered. Right now, at this particular time, we're talking about after a plea has been accepted and entered in the court. That's why, that's why Sidney had to fight the um, the plea, whether he actually pleaded guilty through the plea colloquy. She was saying that that was wrong because she, if she can get that removed, then the the motion for the, what is it, 42B? The four, was it 42 or 46? It was uh, uh, 48. The, for, the 48. The 48A motion, that will be, oh, you keep changing, you keep changing, <laughs> you gotta keep changing this camera. <laughs> yeah, like well, the, the, the reason why that motion, and the 48A motion, is most powerful during the trial phase. So, so everyone understands, and I hate teaching law on the fly like this, but trials are usually coming in two phases. You have the you have the guilt, the guilt phase in a criminal trial, and then you have the sentencing phase. And in, 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 in civil cases, you have the liability phase and you have the damages phase. So in the, in in criminal trials, for instance, like propensity evidence and hearsay evidence, they're not generally not allowed in the trial phase, but they are allowed. In the sentencing phase, in the sentencing phase, you can use propensity evidence and to, to show that the person's even worse off to get a, a, a harsher sentence. So in the trial phase, the, the 48, the 48A motion is a, is a no-brainer because you can't force the government to prosecute, right? But in the sentencing phase, the court now has a role because the prosecutor doesn't even have to show up to the sentencing phase. The judge can just say, okay, you've been convicted, and I'm going to sentencing phase. That's why I think Sidney Powell had three had three distinct things that she needed to do. She needed to, number one, get the plea thrown out or get the plea set aside. If she can do that, then the Rule 48A motion is good. If she can't do that, that gives Sullivan enough where he can now drag this thing out with this leave of the court because now you're after your post your post plea. And that's why Sullivan keeps harping on post plea. Post plea, post plea, post plea, because he knows the 48A motion, he has the most authority to deny it only in a post only in a um, in a sentencing setting, um, procedural posture, and not a trial procedural posture. I, I know that was long, but that that's kind of the way I saw it. Well, and, and I mean, and Robert, you'll you'll feel in on uh, try, uh, get in on this as well. But my understanding is that it doesn't really, uh, it's not really definitive if it's post plea or pre plea because someone can someone can withdraw their plea after sentencing. So. I mean, is is do you have anything to add in terms of that? Is like it's a good argument that maybe there's a there's more discretion, less discretion to refuse the 48 a dismissal before plea, but ultimately not much more discretion after plea. I don't know. I think Judge Sullivan has been using witchcraft to screw with my camera. So the uh, but putting that aside, the uh, uh, yes, yeah, he, you can withdraw your plea at any time. And the there was uh, the main uh, limitation for Sidney Powell is she's an appellate lawyer. So she comes, she was a longtime federal appellate, uh, she worked for the federal government, the prosecutors, the Department of Justice as a federal appellate lawyer, then moved over to the defense side. One of her big clients initially was uh, was Enron, people connected to the Enron prosecutions. That's where she exposed a lot of government misconduct and corruption. She's not so much a trial lawyer, and I don't think she has a lot of experience dealing with rogue, what I would call a rogue judge. So I think that's what you saw. So the uh, be, and so it, it, it you know, she kind of what did walk into the trap in the sense of if she was going to move to disqualify, I need to do it earlier. I think she was agitated that she thought, well, Lee Sullivan now has the message. He's going to, you know, get the get the lesson from the Court of Appeals, which is, hey, do a clean hearing. Don't make it long. Dismiss the case. Show that you really weren't going to do something crazy and move on. Uh, Judge Sullivan is too dumb to get that message. So I've always told people there's two kinds of judges that I have difficulty with, but the third is the worst. I can deal with dumb judges. I can deal with corrupt judges. Uh, deal, when you get a dumb, corrupt judge, you're just screwed um, because they're not smart enough. You can use their corruption to motivate them to do the right thing and if you're creative. If they're not real bright, but they're morally driven, you can find a way to appeal to their conscience. When they have neither a high IQ nor a strong conscience, well, good luck with that. Um, and you get results like Sullivan where he clearly has not got the message from Barr. That's why Barr keeps sending intel and information out and leaking it out. Okay, delay it. Uh, I guarantee you Barr is going to use the Flynn case to keep dumping all kinds of negative information that's going to get closer and closer and closer to Obama and Biden's deliberate direct role in all of this. And remember, everybody, Sally Yates is corrupt. She's going to get named in some of this stuff coming out. But he Sullivan's not even smart enough to know how to protect some of the institutional people who want him to do what he's doing. 
uh, nor is Gleason, frankly. You want to look at corruption? Just look up HSBC, James Comey, Robert Mueller, and Gleason when he was a judge. Just Google that and see what pops up, folks. Um, so and now how I would have <clears throat> – if I, I, I generally don't say when I like a lawyer how I would handle things differently because they know things about the case file I obviously don't know. Um, what I can say is that in general on the fly – uh, I would have been more aggressive, uh, but if I was going to file motions, I would have filed them before now. Um, I wouldn't have asked for them afterwards, and I would have used the word corruption over and over and over again, and I would have used it for the Obama administration. I would have tied it in, and I would have tied it into ju- – uh, I would have used the phrase judicial corruption. Um, so when he asked that rhetorical question, didn't your client plead twice? It would have been an excellent opportunity, yes, due to the gaslighting by judicial corruption, government corruption, and uh, and other corruption, including high-ranking members of the Obama administration, including by the District of Columbia with the first judge assigned, having a special relationship with Peter Stroke, start to contaminate the file in such a way that Sullivan realizes, I keep going down this path, the people I'm trying to protect are going to get burned, burned, and burned. Um, but I thought the whole proceeding made Sullivan look bad in the end. I think it was designed to justify his position. I think it undermined it with most fair-minded people. Um, he, he raised, of course, the Flynn support, and it really didn't empower the critics. And you know that because they didn't jump on what was said at the hearing, other than it, oh, Sidney Powell talked to Trump about a pardon. Big deal. Yeah, that's, I mean that's the only that's the only thing that that was remotely sensational that came out of it. It was sort of a bombshell as a as a fizzle bombshell. Um, two two things, actually. One, I brought it up earlier, but the idea of pardoning commuting, everybody says Sullivan wants to drag this on. One way or another, Trump can pardon Sullivan tomorrow if he wants. He can pardon him anytime up to leaving office. So the idea would be not that they want to drag this on into the new administration because presumably it'll never get there. Before leaving office, you mean. But they, but they want, they, 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 Sullivan wants to drag it on to force Trump to pardon, which would be the, which would be the idea. Um, what do we think, uh, I'm trying to make uh, sense of it, what do we think of um, Sidney Powell saying that she told Trump not to pardon Sullivan? Uh, so, no, sorry, I, Flynn, sorry. See, if I had been in Sidney's position, I would have been yeah. more blunt and personal. I would have said, oh, you know, Your Honor, I told him there was no need to pardon him, even though he's expressed public concern at the outrageous conduct that took place here, because I had mistaken confidence that Your Honor would actually do something about all this corruption. I mean, I would have been blunt and personal. That would have, that would, that, it would have been, let's go at it. Let's go at it. And, <laughs> and, and I'm going to make you bleed as much as you try to make me bleed. And but, even judges that aren't the brightest bulbs in the block usually get the message and try to transition into some. He would have just said, okay, I'm done with you, Sydney. Mr. G- uh, judge, ex-judge, please <laughs> tell us again. Grandstand some more and tell me how great I am uh, before you build a statute right here in court for but, me. But, but, but this one, don't forget, though. <laughs> Sydney Powell is not a trial attorney. You know, she's no. she's she's an appellate attorney. And when, when you're the trial attorney, you have to know when your judge is pushing you and when to push back. But appellate attorneys are only used to taking that flack from judges. You got a panel of six judges and they just throw flack and you just got to take it. And that's what and she was trying to push back. But it was you can tell she was trying to treat it as an appellate judge. So it, 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 it was it was it was it was tough. And that's why it went on for, for so long. But I, I do want to correct the record on one thing, because. As a prosecutor, you're right. A, a, a defendant can withdraw a plea almost at any time. But the the rules here in New York, and even in the, the rules of civil of um the rules of criminal procedure in the federal circuit, the, there is a point where you can't withdraw your plea unless um I, I forgot the, the rules um for eleven in, in um in a rule yeah in a rule eleven it says you can if if before the court accepts the plea you can withdraw your plea for any reason. Yes. Judge Sullivan keeps saying, but it says if the if the court accepts the plea, and that's what the colloquy happens, and that's why she was attacking the colloquy. If mm-hmm. the court accepts the plea, then the court can, right? And this is before the court imposes sentence, but the court accepted the plea. The court can um it, it 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 has this test. It's called the fair and just reason test. And there's a test mm-hmm. that the court can go through. I think so, I think. Flynn can pass that test because generally the test is, is there going to be any harm to the government's case? So forth, so forth, so forth. Yep. But I think Sullivan understands that right now, if she was to go and, and ask for this plea to be withdrawn, which she's been doing, and she's doing it in three different ways. She's saying that the plea was accepted incorrectly, that it was accepted under the false pretenses, and that the government itself case can't be harmed because the government's saying well, there is no case, right? So right. I think every which way this plea should be withdrawn. But 
I think Sullivan is playing Sullivan is playing the political game of let's just draw it out. You, 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 you want to, you know, you want to make another motion? Okay, yeah, write that up, send it back to me in two weeks, and then I gotta have Sullivan respond to that in two weeks, and now we're in another month then. So I, I think that is the game that Sullivan is playing. And, and I think it's I think it's a, it's a it's dramatic, it's it's horrible for Flynn. But that's the game he's playing. It's obvious, I think. Go ahead. I'm and, sorry. And, and it makes a joke out of the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals pretended that he was, oh, he was just going to have a normal hearing and everything was going to be fine and he was going to dismiss. Now they've been exposed for the frauds that they are because they, it was clear from the record that Sullivan had this intention of delay, 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 of, of dragging this thing out, and they pretended it was otherwise. And honestly, this was... This Sullivan's actions, if he keeps on this path, uh, the, the the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit can kiss his Supreme Court ambitions goodbye because he gambled heavily that Sullivan would get the message. Uh, and he Sullivan clearly did not get the message. And now it makes his ruling look bad in retrospect because uh, they're going to have to shut this door down the road. Because other political rogue judges are going to play the same game in a political case when the politics is on the other side of the equation. This was not a test of the seriousness or the a superficial analysis to ensure that the justification was there. This was, and, and like Nate is saying, hey, yeah, let's let's we'll we'll look into the um, authenticity of this document another week. Make the motion to to disqualify me another another. That's another. I waited six months. <laughs> Once I made the motion to disqualify. It took two months to get the hearing, six months to get the judgment, and it was not granted. It was all wasted wasted time. Um, there was one thing I want to say. Sorry, another thing that I, I just I couldn't believe was when Sullivan uh, purported, and I'm getting Sullivan and Flynn mixed up, so I, my apologies if I do it again. Sullivan purported not to know why Contreras recused himself from the file. I mean, the, and I said that on the- That was so strange. It was strange because like I, it made, it, talk about gaslighting. I felt crazy. I was like, did not Sidney Powell actually talk about this in one of the briefs? I mean, there's been a She wrote it in a brief, yeah, about how he was in the struck text messages and he had posted, yeah, like, like I, how could I, you not know that? I genuinely felt crazy. Like, am I hallucinating? Did I have some sort of cognitive hallucination? But, 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 but to be fair, Viva, most judges don't read the briefs that and well, it, it's really their, their court attorney so then, then, then let me make, then let's go to the analogy of a hollow barrel making more noise than <laughs> an empty barrel because that's a pretty silly thing to say i mean one of the issues one of the crux issues was that the the, the plea before Contreras itself was invalid because he was conflicted and therefore any plea in front of him was invalid it's right it was my it was a mind-blowing thing to say with so many people watching um but that, I mean, it, it, that, that was it. Uh, I had another thought, but I lost it. Robert, what were you going to say? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, just the, the going back to Nate's thing on the uh, the natural instinct for a lawyer that hasn't dealt with a lot of rogue judges at the trial court level is to say, move to disqualify because you're just so mad and you're agitated and you're irritated. That's just a trap. The judge that just gives the judge a chance to delay proceedings. He gives him a chance to talk great about himself. I, 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 I have never gone that path. You know, in, in some states, you have an automatic right of disqualification. You can exercise it at certain times, et cetera. But uh, outside of that context, I always go to what's going to expose and embarrass this judge and hit, 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 and do it in nice diplomatic language. You don't have to be mean or nasty about it. You can just hit it at, at, at that language. And that's the path that, to take. But it's just something that she's unfamiliar with. Um, and I, I think she's also shocked and frustrated that this keeps going, gets dragged out in a way that what she is, is as an appellate lawyer, you look at all the past history. And she's like, this has never happened before. And so I've been involved in a lot of cases where things have never happened before. Uh, so I'm, I'm accustomed to it and, and react to it. But it's not unusual for her to do what she did. Um, well, yeah, is, 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 she, is she a criminal lawyer? Because only reason only reason why I'm asking is because the, the part with Sul the, the, the piece that always upsets me with Sullivan says, well, he's pleaded guilty and is perjury. And I'm like. She should automatically jump on it. She's like, you know, the federal rules of criminal procedure says you can withdraw your guilty plea. It doesn't mention that you'll be held for perjury. It says you can do it, and it gives specific examples of when and how you can do it. So, yeah, you can withdraw your plea. You're a judge. How can you not know this? It, Let's it, just look at the – like, you know what I mean? It's it's like him asking that question would, would just – you know, it, it seems like she just wasn't prepared to say, yes, you can. The federal rules of, of criminal procedure allows you to do it. You know, Yes. Now, I mean, yeah. one, one caveat on the recusal thing, if I'm ever before Judge Sullivan in the future, I probably will move to disqualify by just pointing out how stupid I've referred to him over time and the <laughs> uh, based on that fact. But the, uh, 
Uh, I want people, people should appreciate that it is the judge him or herself that decides on the recusal, Robert. So he might take great pleasure in making you go to the appeal so he can so he can petition for rehearing but not be a party to the suit because they decided it was a sua sponte um, uh, rehearing. That was that was that was garbage. That, that really but 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 that was you know sometimes even though it's garbage you have to appreciate mm. the beauty of how they manipulated the it law was skill. because. I mean, Oh, that was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, that's why the, your most dangerous judge is a uh, smart, corrupt judge who's out to get you. I, 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 those, those judges know how to screw you with style and fashion, and man, getting around them is tough. I know, because I mentioned it in the video today, but it, it, the Court of Appeals has basically gifted this suit back to Sullivan and basically protected him from any recusal obligation. But the way they did that uh, to avoid the question of whether or not he became a party to the suit, during the hearing they said, well, uh, Sullivan petitioned for rehearing, but we at some point decided to hear the sua sponte on our own motion. Thus, we no longer need to address the question of whether or not Sullivan made himself a party to the suit. Some people call it magic legalese, I, I call it the stuff that turns your stomach as an attorney, and it's so frustrating you never want to see or hear about it again. <laughs> um, Zui Hu says, opinions on Amicus getting the final say. Also, can Sullivan deny 48A based on Powell's, Powell's letter to POTUS? So I, I don't think she can, I don't think they can deny the 48A based on the letter to POTUS um, at all. I think that's and a by the way, that was Sullivan's habit, for all those people out there that tell me judges never watch what's out in public arena, Sullivan has disproven that. Sullivan's habit of citing things that are not part of the record or that things that have not been properly admitted from non-parties like Peter Stroke's lawyer just writing a letter. That's, that's insane. It's completely insane. It's, you're not supposed to be doing it. And the uh, and so that by itself was problematic. Uh, if, if I was going to come up with a new recusal argument, it would be something like that. A judge, I'm worried you're contaminated by things that aren't supposed to be part of the record. You know the rules of evidence. Suddenly you're reviewing things you're not supposed to. You're citing things you're not supposed to. And I would have also used the hearing as an opportunity to reverse the separation of powers question. Make the judicial branch start to face the questions they want to demand to invade the executive branch. I would be like, Judge, I want to know who you've talked to. Have you talked to anyone connected to the Obama administration? Have you had any dinners about this? Have you had any, what research have you done? Because you're citing research that's not part of the file. I want to have a newspaper. A, well, let's take a look at your internet record. Let, let, let's take a look at that. I'm going to need to subpoena that judge because after all, we don't have separation of powers anymore, right? You get to inquire into the executive branch. You get to inquire my conversations with the president. I want to inquire into you. Um, you have to reverse the reverse that, and you have to just uh, it's the old Sun Tzu principle to defeat what is strong, attack what is weak. Uh, and that's the way to, to, to go at those cases. Um, and I think that's what, you know, might've been more effective, but it, you know, it, it is what it is. It, it's making a sideshow that's embarrassing, I think for the judicial system. Uh, and it is to, what I like about it to all my conservative friends. It's educating them on how, what I've been trying to preach that only mostly my liberal friends have been aware of for the past 20 years, which is their systemic problems in the way, uh, prosecutors act, the way judges act that often corrupt. This is how People, people are easily coerced. Like when people are saying, oh, he pled twice. He admitted it twice. It was like, one, there's a legal argument about whether, in fact, he pled under the rules. But putting that aside, I said people admit to crimes they didn't commit all the time. Every Number day. one, most unreliable form of evidence is eyewitness testimony. Number two is confessions. Uh, watch the great movie Under Suspicion. Ah, it took a little while to reference No, it, 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 it happened to me as a prosecutor. It's like my, It was like my third case. A guy coughed it all up. He admitted it. And next thing you know, you get a tape and it wasn't even there. I'm like, why would you plead? Because he's like, because I was just so scared. You, you, you know, because you know, you go, you go into one of those meetings and you say, I got this, I got this, I got this. You're going to jail. You can take a plea. He's like, all right, I'll take a plea. He's like, you just look so serious. I was like, but if you didn't do it, why? <laughs> it's very common. When people <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Under suspicion, you have Morgan Freeman uh, cross-examining uh, Gene Hackman and Morgan Freeman is Pursue, he's not he's not like a corrupt guy that's trying to induce a fake or false corrupt uh, uh, or coerce a confession. He really believes it. And that's the most dangerous form of confession where the cop really believes that the, that the person is confessing truthfully. And it's because there's all kinds of ways to get false confessions for a wide range of reasons. And that's I, I brought up with all these people. It's like, hold it on happens. a second. All of, a lot of you that are harassing me on Twitter, you're fans of the Central uh, Park Five getting getting to walk. All of them confessed. OK, yeah, it wasn't in the police context. It was in a different confession context. Some would argue that's even worse because uh, it's more detailed, more factual, more spontaneous. Um, but we recognize all the time that confessions and admissions are never a final arbiter of truth. If they were, tons of innocent people would be in prison to this day. 
Robert, you mentioned it. I mean, I'm just answering when somebody super chat here uh, uh, put the comment in. But if the charges are dismissed without prejudice, then Trump partisan would it be workable? It would be workable, but it would be a political victory for Sullivan. I, I think that's. I uh, if I had to change my prediction, I'd say that's where it's going to go because they certainly spent a lot of time talking about the with prejudice dismissal versus without. Yeah, the caveat to all this: if he actually denies the Rule 48 motion, the Court of Appeals is going to reverse him because they're going to be very agitated that he didn't get the message and they'll probably slap yeah. him publicly in a way that he, that everyone else gets the message because they don't want to see this repeated. But one, 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 one thing I, I do want to say is the ethics issue from Sidney Powell. And I, and I, and, and uh, I, yeah. I, 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 I do, I do want to be fair for, for, for on both sides in the sense of as a prosecutor, and well, for myself as a former prosecutor, if the defense counsel goes to my boss and tells me to be removed and doesn't have a good faith basis for that, just I just don't like this guy and he should be removed. That is a little iffy. But I think Sidney Powell, instead of attacking it with, I do have a good faith basis. They haven't turned over Brady evidence. And the fact that they didn't turn over Brady evidence is the reason why I'm asking for their removal. I think that's the way you go to so so you don't have the ethical issue of you know why are you going to the prosecutor's boss to get him removed without any type of um without without with the, without some type of some type of probable cause but um that you know there is an issue and I think she has to address it because you you know again it's, it, you can't just go to the prosecutor's boss because that's putting undue pressure on them and, and you do have to have a good faith basis to it now now now. Do I think she does have a good faith basis? Yeah, if, if you're hiding Brady evidence, you're not turning over stuff, then you can go and ask for that. But I think that's what Sullivan is getting to. Well, you went to their boss. What was your good faith basis? And then you went to your their boss's boss, the president, and had conversations. So that's so now, no matter how what, what people think about it, but I think that's the ethical piece that Sullivan was alluding to. That's why he went through that chain. Well, when you sent this letter to the AG and when you talk to the president, because he's, he's making the ethical issue about the, the inline prosecutors who were there, and that she was trying to get them removed without a good face basis. Yeah, the, the thing on that is that technically, you're in, legally, you're entitled to do that. So people lobby higher ups all the time in the Justice Department. It happens frequently in cases. So I, I like there was one implication where he was suggesting that because she hadn't appeared in court that she couldn't represent him. That's hogwash. Uh, you, the, that frequently you represent someone before you appear in court. The, uh, the, that's part one. And then, and then part two is I get him trying to make the implication. I get prosecutors don't like it. Uh, but I know a lot of high ranking defense lawyers that use that tactic on a day, common, uh, continuous basis. So the, it, it's not put it this way within the defense bar. It's not considered unethical. It's not a violation of any professional rules. It might be a discourteous so that the prosecutor, that prosecutor is going to remember you and dislike you and be upset about it and so forth. And I've not never used that path. I, I, I tell the prosecutor up front, you know, what I think. And, and, and if I'm going to go up their higher ups, I tell them in advance, I'm going to their higher ups. The, uh, but I, the, that, that sort of indoor political lobbying rarely works. Um, so the, uh, uh, I think I, that's where I would have been focused. I would have attacked Sullivan right away, attacked the court right away. As soon as he asked that question, I'd have said, look, no, I talked to the president. He was going to pardon him. He'd made public statements about it. My client wanted to be vindicated in the court of law. And I was incredibly naive about how much your honor is committed to that. I apologize. I'd and say that's I, the point I would have made. To, to, totally agree. To say. He'll have to defend himself. Have to, but he, usually they're not ready for it because I've, I've dealt with a lot of these judges that are used to bullying people in the courtroom and you fire back and they don't know what to do. The real crazy ones, kind of like Sullivan, they've threatened, of course, to throw me in jail. So well, there's that experience. I was uh, just thinking, Robert, if Sidney Powell had taken that line with him, I have no doubt there would have been a threat of contempt of court, especially knowing. That's the beautiful be on the phone. Be like, yeah, hey, you have to send those marshals. It's going to take a little while. <laughs> Um, is there any? Is there something that can be done about judges like Sullivan? I mean, we've discussed this before, but really, the only the only sanction is uh, impeach them. Yeah, politically. Impeach them. Yeah, politically, yeah, politically, you can impeach them, but they they only impeach judges they dislike that disserve the institutional sources of power. Uh, they, it, it's rare that someone uh, uh, gets impeached for anything and and for truly egregious conduct like getting caught bribes, etc. Um, well, don't don't, don't forget the first federal judge. But wasn't the first federal judge from the like, Supreme Court? They tried to impeach that person for having bad rulings or whatever. Oh, and it back didn't in the day, out, I mean, so, when yeah. they started out, it was all, it was all out political war. But they basically dropped that. Well, one, they dropped it really after that case because it lost in the Senate, and there was a lot of complaints about the misuse and abuse of impeachment uh, in the Senate by some of the, the better legal scholars, in my view. That's why I, I cited all those in the Trump argument as to uh, what where I thought impeachment 
should stay limited. I, I know it can get broad, but it's a bad idea when it gets broad. Um, and the, that that the Samuel Chase impeachment from the 1800s is uh, the failure of that. And, and the way the scholastic legal opinion reacted to it is the reason why we didn't abuse that power uh, down the road. Now, my own view is, you know, there's a current debate about who should govern the ethics of courts. Justice Breyer wants to keep it within the federal court system. My view is it makes no sense to have judges write their own rules, judge their own rules, and enforce their own rules. The whole point of tripartite branches of government and Montesquieu's did checks and balances is gone when that happens, especially when you compound that with the people most likely to know about judicial corruption, lawyers, are also being regulated by the very judges who would control whether your accusation of corruption could take away your own law license if you do so. Uh, so I have a problem with that. The executive branch should be in charge of monitoring judges, uh, ethical compliance in terms of enforcement. The legislative branch should write the rules. And then the judges can adjudicate the application of it, whether it was fair, as long as they're neutral judges at the end of the process. But it's deeply problematic to let judges be the uh, the, the, the sole arbiter of what the rules are, who enforces the rules, and how to judge them. But but then but then how do you, how do you get over the Marbury versus Madison issue? Because no matter what the no matter what it says on paper, the judges are going to be the one to interpret it. You know that, oh, yeah, that that's and, and that's and I, I've never agreed with Marbury versus Madison. I know you don't. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> Robert, you, and you mentioned something earlier about uh, Sullivan appealing to. Uh, documentation information not in the file specifically with the trump situation but i didn't make a big deal of it in in, the, in my analysis today because i you know i don't want to go a little overboard what about this peter stroke letter from his attorney coming in the night before this hearing saying that some annotations on some of the documentation were altered and that it wasn't strokes handwriting and the judge considering this and referring to it in the context of a hearing where it hadn't been admitted as evidence the authenticity of it had not i mean it just seemed Absolutely, um, it was mind boggling. I mean, it's just mind boggling. By a non party. Not only that, the guy that was acquitted on the far related charges by the judge after the trial uh, that related to Flynn, his lawyer has tried to send stuff into Flynn, and Flynn and, and the judge has either ignored it or struck it from the record. So it's, it's just a joke what he's been doing. You're not supposed to have, there's reasons why we have rules of evidence. There's reasons why there's proceedings in place. And Sullivan just ignores it whenever it suits his purposes. Because the, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Can, can I ask you guys, isn't that classic hearsay? Oh, An out of court statement. But, but it's like, how, really? how and, and, and he's referring to it. Not even supposed to have legal access to uh, to put in things into the record in the first place. Yeah. So, I, so when, I, when, when I heard him say it, I was like, I was like, hold on. He's literally bringing in some unknown out of court statement and offering it for the truth. Right. Yes. It says it's got. I'm like, yeah. how is this not hearsay? And, this and, is textbook and, hearsay. Forget even hearsay. What about the what about potential contempt charges if Stroke is lying yet again and saying, "Oh, well, now it's out in the news that Stroke says it was altered." He's not under penalty of 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 of, of contempt or perjury He's for not having even a party to the case. That, but that's why you have the hearsay rule. That's why the hearsay rule yeah. exists. <laughs> that is He's exactly the reason. Cross examination. He's not a party to the case. So there's rules about what can be put into the judicial record, and there's rules about what can be admitted into evidence. And Sullivan routinely and flagrantly violated them when it served his purpose. No, he even right. quoted a newspaper article. No, it's, it's, it's good. Yes, yes. Madness where he was in front of the court of appeal saying, I just, you know, I just, I just have questions to ask. I'm not going to go yeah. into this. He's, he was, in, he was talking about documents received the night before from a non-party and talking about it as though it was a matter of fact and not probably the most suspicious statement from someone whose credibility uh, is, is, has been impugned to say the least. It was, it, I, I didn't think I understood it because it was so outlandish and so out in left field. No, it's, it, it's, it's, you, you are right. It's classic hearsay. It's an out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. The reason why that was being offered to show that those statements were, were altered and that's what it, it was I, at, at that point, I, I think Sullivan is just, it, it makes Sullivan seem too, too angry to just, and in other words, he's just looking for every angle to get Flynn. And I, and I think at a point you have to kind of stop and say, what am I doing here? I'm quoting the New York Post and I'm quoting some guy who just sent me something in the night before. And I'm, and I'm questioning the attorney about it. Like, this is fact. He says they were like, really? I was like, you, you're really giving me an out of court statement. You know, it, it's, it's crazy. And then it, how can you object to the judge? Like object, judge objection hearsay. Who's oh, offering the hearsay? Oh, You're okay. offering the hearsay. <laughs> and if Sidney Powell does, it's like, okay, well, let's bring in Stroke as an attorney. We'll schedule a hearing. Where we oh, can my God. I mean, 